Hello everyone, today we talk about the Aragonese Kingdom of Sicily, concluding our historical regions series as far the uh, Sicilian history is concerned properly. Uh, we uh, already addressed um, an important amount of information about especially the early phase, today's video with the uh, Sicilian Vespers and the succession right from properly Hohenstaufen to the Angevins and to the Aragonese. So there, there is this crossroad that we will be repeating a little and eventually look at the broader uh, history of Sicily at this point, which was, uh, as you know, practically severed from the uh, what, what was becoming effectively the Neapolitan mainland as a distinct Angevin kingdom of Sicily because the unity of, of the kingdom was ideally maintained by the rulers, but that would uh, eventually uh, uh, settle uh, with with a s strategic style, de facto, between the Angevins and the Aragonese, uh, with the creation of probably two different kingdoms that still compromised fundamentally about this uh, original unity, uh, to reconquer each other, and uh, for, for a while the Angevin waves of, re of reconquest were really hard, but Sicily uh, resisted um, because of the enormous mm, logistical difficulties posed just by the uh, siege of the coastal uh, towns and the control of the interland, and especially properly the um, let's say the, the broader international game that was developing at that point because not just Aragon had stepped in and uh, frankly Sicily for a while yes was ruled by uh, the Aragonese dynasts but in that kind of confederal um, let's say mindset for which effectively all the lands of the crown of Aragons did retain some form of autonomy at some point uh, what we call Aragonese Sicily was even in conflict with Aragon itself um, there were other and and the game was complicated in fact by for example the, the presence of uh, at some point of of Sardinia and was conquered by the Aragonese proper and also were in somewhat uh, competitive um, connection with Sicily but in more in general probably the continental situation the the Ghibelline Guelph struggle uh, in which uh, Sicily effectively signed uh, the the empire right aligning itself with for example Henry the seventh during his expedition in Italy where he would have liked essentially to knock out uh, the Angevins and recovering what had been the older Swabian legacy but at the same time we're we are looking at um, a broader parcelization and yet stabilization of European powers uh, from essentially this uh, this crisis of medieval civilization from the late 13th and the first half of, of the 14th century, which would instead settle this macros, say, this regions, right, this various areas, kingdoms that would, uh, you know, rather than expand uh, in properly, rather have problems of consolidation, right, internally. And this is in many ways uh, the case of Sicily. Eurasia um, outspent itself in a way, so it's, it was more about the, the political institutional building sometimes at the detriment of the same monarchic power and this was in a sense evident uh, on the longer run in the Sicilian case given that the baronial power both in Sicily and in, in Naples for the, the same Aragonese of Alfonso V to find out uh, the hard way later after the conquest, the latter's conquest of Naples um, that would uh, necessitate essentially a compromise uh, between the, the crown and these uh, noblemen that played sometimes properly as as uh, autonomous states within state. This is particularly evident actually in Naples it was larger if you pick especially the Principality of Taranto and the Duchy of Calabria. Sicily was more compact but there were still some local dynasties uh, as we've seen here that unavoidably would also um, side with uh, also the external threat um, with the Angevins initially uh, and mixing actually the very complicated um, uh, political legacy of the Sicilian kingdom, as we will see now. Um, so, as we've seen also in the previous videos, the history of Aragonese Sicily formally began on September the 26th, 1282. On this date, Charles I of Anjou uh, left 
uh, the siege of Messina by crossing the straits back to uh, to Calabrian and, and Naples after the uh, the Vespers had brought the Aragonese in power uh, in uh, in Palermo, as we will see now, and uh, the fact of securing the first Aragonese rule on on the island that the Angevins had rushed like to to you know to to get rid of immediately, um, and so um, this is at the time of Peter the Third of Aragon that had landed in Trapani and uh, eventually was made king. Um, of of Sicily by the local uh, communities and in 1412 the kingdom would pass to the Trastamara dynasty of, of Aragon would ending formally um, so when Sicily passed under the direct and uh, uh, united Spanish domination uh, on January the 23rd 1516 at the death of King Ferdinand II of Aragon. As you know, actually, Spain was not literally unified. Well, it was dynastically unified, but the state was still separated, so Sicily did maintain some broader connection with, with Aragon rather than with, with Castile, in spite of the, the you know, uh, overflowing Spanish power altogether in Mediterranean at that point. Um, and so with Sicily, you have... Uh, in this this centuries, this couple of centuries, factually, um, a broader detachment from what had been the uh, the greater unity of, of of southern Italy, even when Alfonso V of Aragon had conquered Naples, and in fact maintaining, as we'll see now, two distinguished Sicilian uh, vice uh, realms properly that would remain in the internet in the institutional. Uh, form right this domination and at that point it was objectively more convenient than having a larger kingdom altogether um, as Sicily and the southern Italian mainland were historically um, importantly different right and uh, naturally this political separation under different dynasties had further increased this divide but uh, Naples was was the strongest right so that even the same Aragonese while when they conquer it uh, they settled their, their court there, and Sicily would remain uh, still more peripheral. We're talking about actually still rich and fertile areas of Europe that would maintain throughout all the modern age uh, a, a very high uh, demographic and economical uh, relevance, considered that Naples in the 18th century was still the, the largest city in Europe. Um, but as we were saying before, also the baronial power kind of made these lands compared to the uh, Norban, Norman Swabian times uh, much less of that kind of uh, statally solid uh, albeit for medieval standards at the time a unity that uh, the these lands altogether were kind of provided with also the, the nature of vice realms what meant you know some political subordination especially uh, as, as the the Spanish Empire's power increased in the early modern age of course the um, this became kind of more subordinated lands, right? Devoid of uh, kind of a properly uh, of an independent policy on the road. In the case of Naples, still having some of that capacity and autonomy, but this is true also for you know modern Spanish Lombardy, for example, uh, and so on. Uh, now, going back to our medieval times, from the moment uh, King Charles uh, of Anjou uh, set foot in in Sicily. Uh, a series of revolts had undermined the Angevin power on the island, right? The ex exorbitant fiscalism of the new dynasty, the lack of sensitivity towards the problems of the people, let's say, or better, the noblemen, and the abuses carried out by the ruling class had soon antagonized uh, an important part of the population and surely gathered kind of the, the, the decisive moral force in opposition to this, to this domination. And as we've seen in the video about Angevin Naples, also in the one about Charles of Anjou, right, this was somewhat unavoidable by a certain degree. But it's obvious that Sicily, as we were just saying, was losing its centrality because at this point the kingdom was still one and the Angevins had shifted the capital from Palermo to Naples. Um, and so many Sicilians uh, also consider, of course, the, 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 the ways of government of the time weren't really you know, 
particularly gentle, kind-hearted, right? So this meant properly a, a harsh, uh, abusive foreign occupation, like in any other single context, even a, you know, same national rulers on, on their own country. Uh, because at that point, the baronial power had already, you know, made itself felt, uh, given all the various upheavals that had struck Sicily by that point. And so monarchs had to rule with iron fist. The, the Angevins came with also properly a, a specific mindset of properly of imperial expectations and grandeur, right? This was still like one of the largest, most important kingdoms uh, in Europe. The gate to, to Constantinople, the, the French at this point were essentially about to achieve, and that's what the Sicilian Vespers actually aborted uh, retrospectively. The, re the unification of uh, East and West, right? Uh, think about here, France, plus the county of Provence. So Fr France is the largest, most powerful country in Europe at this point. Sicily, uh, which is, if not the second, surely at least the third, fourth most important country in Europe at this point, um, plus uh, the, the hegemony, uh, the, the important political hegemony over central northern Italy, the papal support, because the papacy just now was kind of freaking out of all these uh, French all around, but it was still supportive of 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 their of their monarchy, especially, uh, and pl plus expanding with other influence on in the Mediterranean, in Greece, and with other ambitions. Think about you know the, even just the uh, the Crusade plans of Louis the Ninth in Tunisia and then in Egypt, etc. So it was a massive power, um, and um, in the Sicilian case, the centrality of Palermo had meant uh, all uh, a series of privileges and of uh, international centrality of the court by the time Frederick II was objectively the, the center of Europe um, from a broader cultural point of view and, and beyond. Um, while at this point the shift towards Naples it was closer to Rome and essentially the acquiescence of the papacy under Clement IV and Martin IV uh, towards Charles of Anjou did not facilitate uh, the uh, the situation in Sicily that at this point was also throughout all this time, especially during the the War of the Vespers that dragged on for decades, um, was undergoing an important economical uh, decay. Right. Um, in general, it was the the public structure was kind of collapsing. Also because as we'll see now, when the Aragonese set foot in the island for for a long time, it wasn't even certain whether they would have actually maintained it. Um, and so the barons again expanded dramatically their private power, but there was probably a collapse, like the, the, probably this connection from the mainland brought to uh, some broader crisis. Um, the 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 island was ravaged by armies. There were lots of Sicilians essentially becoming mercenaries, going to fight abroad, and all this kind of stuff. Um, uh, in spite of still the the sizable relevance of of, of this uh, king. Um, so, as you know, the, the Vespers were fundamentally triggered by the um, the broader Sicilian, Aragonese, and Byzantine uh, Ghibelline policy against uh, Charles of Anjou, that encompassed by at that point also other powers in Europe. Essentially, the Germans were just recovering at this point from the Great Interregnum, and still they wouldn't basically set foot in Italy for other uh, for other 20 years or more. Um, so it was mainly up to these Mediterranean powers now to try to uh, overthrow this balance uh, that otherwise would have made objectively Andrew in power the uh, easily the dominant one against the interests of the emerging maritime Aragon, at least of their cat this Catalan um, uh, part, uh, would have easily crush the Byzantines because we know that, that the Angevin expedition to Constantinople would have recovered quite easily. The the city, uh, the Palaiologo, didn't have uh, enough forces. So it was really a, you know, an existential matter in many ways for those powers. So across the Mediterranean, in, in, in the Kingdom of Aragon, Queen Constance, that as we've seen in the previous videos, was the daughter of Manfred. So uh, factually, the only descendant of the Swabian 
kings of Sicily, you know, that Manfred was an illegitimate son of Frederick II, but uh, he had managed to have himself recognized as, uh, as, as king of Sicily in Palermo by essentially usurping the throne uh, to his uh, nephew, Conradin. That was the legitimate Hohenstaufen heir, and you know what happened, sadly enough, with all the events of Benevent, Tagliacozzi, etc. Um, so, Constance called, like, her grandmother, by the way, the, the last of the Normans, Constance of Hauteville, pressed her husband, Peter III of Aragon, to return to Sicily, where the population still retained the memory and the splendor achieved with his um, grandfather, the, the Emperor Frederick II. I was saying, you know, ma uh, grandmother before his great grandmother, Constance of Altaville, to Constance uh, of, of Aragon. Um, naturally, it was a very different situation there, and uh, probably, you know, there were ways and ways medieval powers tested what was the situation on the ground at the time. It, it, but, so Sicily could not be restored in the Swabian grandeur, but uh, it was permeable. There were connections with the local barons that were still kind of, you know, in part uh, gibbling, thieving, etc. So the spark uh, of the beginning of, of the revolt across the island called Sicilian Vespers unblocked, uh, say, properly triggered the situation. On March the 31st, 1282, a veritable carnage of uh, French began in Palermo. This was, as you know, for a long time seen as a kind of a popular revolt because of nationalistic propaganda of the Italian Risorgimento, etc. F factually, it was a much more uh, complicated and complex thing. Um, the people would participate, you know, under the guidance of specific uh, noblemen with this broader international attachments, but definitely, also the foreign presence was very wasn't very appreciated at that point. Uh, and at this point, King Charles, that was again preparing for his Constantinople to an expedition, had to rush in defense of his subjects from the continent. Thus the siege of Messina that we were talking about before began, which lasted a few months without any results, and this will be practically the light motive of the Angevin, of the massive, frankly, massive and repeated, we have, we have seen it in the previous video, uh, Angevin expeditions toward the islands, I mean, for, you know, every every few years, for, for like half a century, where armies in the tens of the thousands launched against uh, the island, but, uh, you know, even they managed to storm, again, a, a fortress in Amman, but they, they would have dramatic difficulties to maintain it, would be harassed from the, you know, the counterattacks, even guerrilla and so on. It was a, a dramatic situation, really. And uh, John of Procida, trusted advisor of the Einstaufen family, that was also in Aragon at this point, because a lot of refugees um, had fled there, we was one of the protagonists of the revolt in Sicily, and it was he who favored uh, the arrival of the same uh, Peter III in the island. You know, the Aragonese landed in Trapani, in the westernmost um, end of of um, of the island, and he was the same leader, essentially, who, who offered the crown to Peter III of Aragon, who was, cr uh, in fact, proclaimed king in, in Palermo. Um, for this, John of Prochida would be appointed Grand Chancellor of Sicily, and this act meant the transformation of a simple insurrection into a real political conflict of international scale between Sicilians and Aragonese on the one hand, and the Angevins, the Papacy, the Kingdom of France, that also had its own quarrels with Aragon, as you know, in the southwest, and the various wealth factions, uh, mainly in Italy, but also of other, you know, international powers aligned with that axis on the other. Now, as soon as the revolt broke out in Sicily, the Aragonese fleet, which landed on August 
the uh, 30th 1282 in Trapani um, uh, was already in uh, Palermo by September of the same year uh, when the um, when Charles of Anjou was forced to retreat by Peter III. Now Peter III was uh, thus free to seize the throne and obtain properly the, the formal recognition of the uh, Sicilian of Sicilian monarch. However, he kept the crowns of Aragon and Sicily divided in the uh, best tradition of the Aragonese rulers and also engaged in the Aragonese crusade in 1284 he left the island. Uh, in his absence he appointed a lieutenant to replace him. Thus Alfonso III of Aragon and James II of Aragon eventually alternated uh, in the in the conduction of the kingdom, uh, mostly or say intermittently for from the distance, the political situation twenty years after the first revolt was still not clear, right? Uh, as Charles the Second of Anjou still claimed the island and the Aragonese that at that time were in difficulty in Spain actually, sought with an agreement with the Angevins a way out of the conflict that was coming to recreate. Um, thus um, to regenerate, to renovate, thus abandoning the Sicilians and, and their expectations. Consider just that this is important that I care about in, in my medieval history videos to, to stress is what it means to rule a country in the Middle Ages, right? You have basically a constant negotiation with, with an overload of communities that you cannot factually impose your control on. Right, so the world situation is, is, is always unstable, it's never to be given for granted, there is never a, a final settlement, especially when there is a, a major power next to you that is threatening to, to invade you back. So plots, revolts, um, risks of any kind, and, and enormous expenses, right, just think about crossing with armies, uh, the fleets. Um, at this point, I made a video about Roger the, the Floor because it, the, also the, the story of the Catalan company of the uh, Almogavares um, mercenaries begins, in a sense, by, by this point. Um, as the, the, Cat the famed Cap uh, Catalan company we also m made a video on actually started from the veterans of the War of the Vespers. And ironically uh, enough, un or Unironically enough, when when the war stopped, as we'll see now, some of these men didn't know what to do. They were hired by the Angevins, um, who used them also to, you know, scatter uh, various garrisons uh, to support the, the various Guelph governments in in central northern Italy. So, uh, it's it's that mixed, right? Sometimes you have even the papacy, uh, famously with Boniface VIII at some point, that would also grant some. You know favors to the Aragonese to 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 piss off the Angevins <laughs> because even though they were allies and they but the, the equilibrium was was so fluid right that you could you know touch a bit here uh, but they're taking from here uh, uh, adding there so um, we still haven't quite gotten in that level of depth and detail but just know because at least I had the fortune of studying these periods in, in detail that, let's say, uh, it, it's really messed up, right? And this videos I make are just kind of little stories, so you can't even complain if I talk for two hours about it and say that th these are just very short introductions, because objectively they are, right? Uh, history is not. Um, some says, I find people on the internet saying, ah, oh, Schwerpuck makes, you know, videos in hyper detail. Is this hyper detail? Right, seriously, because you know, from from a historical point of view, this is not even close to hyper to, to detail in the first place. It's just a, a chat that we're having. Uh, but this is valid for for basically anything I would say historically wise. But you know, and consider this is just kind of medieval history. So uh, we all, we all know something that is very difficult to dominate by a single person in a lifetime. Just think about what contemporary history actually means. So just for a bit of philosophy of history. In any case, um, uh, the Sicilian parliament uh, gathered at the um, Ursino castle in Catania, so this uh, important um, agricultural center in, in the 
northeast of Sicily elected uh, the brother of James the second of Aragon Frederick the uh, Frederick who would become in this sense Frederick of Sicily right and um, the reason being that the the distance with Aragon and all the problems that the Iberian rulers had at home could not uh, at, at that point in, ensure that degree of stability that was needed with the Andrians just next door uh, knocking like you know the wolf uh, with the three piggies uh, without even knocking telling the truth um, and storming uh, inside uh, their home and um, and therefore you know without properly a monarch a leader and this was you know a, a, a something that the same this is important that's why you're talking about the government before the same local communities needed right after all the the medieval mentality was about a king has the faculty of ruling just on behalf of the communities right to defend those natural rights that are given by God and that uh, these sovereigns have to demonstrate to be able to to defend right which Aragon at this point didn't practically even have the, the force altogether to uh, to maintain with that necessary degree of stability so Frederick became king of Sicily it was an important one because he also interfered with this broader international scenario he was the one who sent aid and money especially to Henry VII of Luxembourg who also launched these ra raids uh, all along the Tyrrhenian coast of the uh, Neapolitan kingdom of the Papal States and even beyond in Tuscany to support the Emperor um, and as I was saying before here we have it's a period of great names uh, Roger of Lauria, uh, Roger de Flore uh, all these um, southern Italians mixed with the, the older, also in some cases with the, the Ohnstaufen legacy, with this very developed maritime naval culture. I mean, Roger of Lauria is easily the, the, the Nelson of, of the Middle Ages, is the, the greatest admiral um, to, to mention. And, um, and so all... Um, that's why I mentioned that video about Roger de Flore because it shows all the a bit the, the ambiguity of this situation like piracy, war, trade, right? Even the various barons of the more uh, in both in Sicily and Naples, frankly, would, would organize themselves this kind of thing. They would hire uh, galleys, they would kind of invest there, would raid, um, they would participate to expeditions, they wouldn't, they had their own games going on, international connections. Um, there were other powers at this point that were naturally very interested in what was going on, especially Genoa, uh, that didn't like the Aragonese stepping in, in the Tyrrhenian Sea at all, um, given that uh, also, you know, they were allies with the Angevins, and so the Sicilians, factually at this point, uh, didn't allow them to control the Straits. This partly had occurred also previously, but was a solid bonding with that. Um, so, um, the the election of Frederick as King of Sicily allowed uh, the uh, in fact the the, the Sicilians to, to uh, continue the struggle against both the Angevins and paradoxically even the the Aragonese of Spain of King James that was not happy at all that his brother had been elected uh, King of of, of, of an island that technically belonged to his crown, right? And so that's the rivalry and the hostility also existing within the same crown of Aragon. I made a video about the crown of Aragon last year. It's getting a lot of algorithmic views, so I address those things generally speaking there. I also recently made a video about the kingdom of Valencia. And we will surely talk about uh, Aragonese, Sardinia, about Barcelona, about other things, or, or even Provence, etc. They are very interesting. In any case, um, the Sicilian parliament in the Aragonese period was made up of uh, essentially feudal lords, mayors of the cities, and the counts and the barons, right? And was presided over and convened by the king. So a typical medieval council. You have the feudal lords are objectively the most powerful ones. Um, then kind of local no nobility in form of other barons, counts that were also of, of great relevance. The major, uh, the mayors of the cities that 
were in the southern lands, um, not as as you know politically or military thriving as uh, as the the communes of the, of the center and of the north of of the peninsula, but they were pretty large um, demographically and also. Consider at this point, uh, you know, the, the the Kingdom of Sicily had traditionally exported properly grain to feed Europe. Sometimes also the rest of the Mediterranean. Uh, so they were powerful forces altogether, right? At the um, uh, there had been some kind of uh, political gaming from the side of the monarchs to, you know, give some power to the city, but not too much, so that it could stop the barons. But also they needed the barons for the war fort. And all this kind of stuff. Now, the main function of the parliament was the defense of the integrity of Sicily at this point. It was risk always being uh, conquered uh, by the Angevins or uh, some certain parts of it rebelling and siding with them, things like this. Um, and a maximum value um, also uh, against the absolutism of, of the same king uh, in the interests of the Sicilians. The king, in fact, could neither enter into agreement of any kind uh, political military or economic nor declare wars without having first consulted and obtained the approval of the parliamentary body which by constitution had to be convened at least once a year on the day of all saints the parliament constitutionally had the task of electing the king and also of carrying out the function of the body guaranteeing the correct performance of ordinary justice exercised by executioners, judges, notaries, and other officials of the kingdom, all of previous Swabian and Norman, uh, or even previous uh, legacy and tradition. Um, in 1302, the Peace of Caltabellotta in Sicily was finally signed, which divided the, the older kingdom, so with the, also considering the mainland, into the kingdom of Trinacria, so only Sicily, entrusted to Frederick, and that of Naples. That is the part, uh, the peninsular part, led by uh, uh, by Charles uh, of Anjou, uh, at that time the talking about Charles the Lame, Charles II. The peace of Caltabellotta did establish some, say, political institutional uh, lines between the, uh, acknowledging essentially the situation between the two powers, but it was factually a farce in terms of uh, political and military intentions, because still the strategic situation was convenient for for the Angevins essentially to um, to launch new offensives and also for the Sicilians to, to harass their rivals, especially by sea. Um, and Frederick, entrusted with the crown, uh, entrusted with uh, entrusting town to his son Peter tried to circumvent the peace and the war resumed in fact in 1313 openly a final agreement would be reached only at the death of Peter in 1342 when his son in turn Louis took the throne under the tutelage of John of Aragon and lots of things had happened by this point, uh, but uh, the fact that the Angevins had outspent their resources in terms properly of capacity of um, I mean, the, the majority of the Kingdom of Naples resources were invested for the recovery of Sicily at that point right, not even in the in the Italian policy that was quite expansive I mean, in, in the north with the communes um, and elsewhere like also in uh, consider that Provence was still uh, controlled uh, and that there were issues at the border between the Aragonese, the French, and all these things. But um, the unity of, Isl uh, of, of Sicily, as we've seen, was preserved fundamentally, as a pres uh, as a, um, probably as a separated uh, crown, right? And that's the point of, of the story. And it was probably thanks to John's diplomacy that a first peace agreement was reached with the Angevins, um, the so-called Peace of Catania on November the 8th, 1347. Um, but the war between Sicily and the Kingdom of Naples would have ended only on August the 20th, 1372, after factually 90 years of de facto belligerence, um, or almost, with the, uh, with the Treaty of uh, Avignon, signed by uh, John, uh, John no, of Anjou and Frederick IV of Aragon, 
with the ascent of Pope Gregory the Eleventh. Um, the meanwhile, the Neapolitan Kingdom, as we've seen in, in the dedicated video, was undergoing severe uh, internal strife. So it had lost, especially after the death of Robert the the wise, so-called, the last great Angevin sovereign in the mid-14th uh, century, the, uh, that, that unity, that, uh, let's say, that if you want also international protagonism that had characterized the Kingdom of Sicily as a whole since, you know, the Norman conquest, and uh, essentially the generating that uh, gradual decline that would also that would ultimately bring the, the Aragonese be able to to launch f effective expeditions and against it and seizing the same Naples later on. Uh, after the peace of Caltabellotta, previously Sicily, however, had already beginning to experience a, a long period of relative political stability, because now at least uh, the local monarchy was internationally recognized as such also by the Angevins. The struggles between uh, the two factions of the Sicilian nobility, however, still mirrored the, uh, let's say, not just the, the Aragonese uh, um, Angevin rivalry, but also, you know, the ones existing properly uh, between the Aragonese in Sicily and also internal divisions and factionalism. So, uh, one faction was known as of the Catalans, for obvious reasons, because basically these were the uh, the noblemen that had arrived from Spain and they were ruling there had been they had been felt in one another were part of the administration of the government um, and of these um, families of Iberian origins that arrived to the island at the time of the war against the Angevins we account the Alagones, the De Lunas, the Moncadas, the Peralta, the uh, Valguarnera, etc. Some of these Mm, uh, some members of, of these families, some of these families also participated, for example, the, 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 the Luna, famously enough, even fought for the Angevins at some point. In, in moments of peace, uh, there were uh, those Catalans at uh, Montecatini. Some of them actually, they, they, f they fought to the, to the death, at least they were killed in combat. And, uh, however, from the 20s, of the 14th century, the Florentines completely get rid of the Aragonese forces they, uh, f coming from, from Naples, but by telling essentially to Aragon itself, we don't want your subjects to, to, appear, to show here anymore, which is very fascinating because uh, it shows how they, these people were also kind of an inch from, from Sicily itself. Like you have basically a conflict between Naples and Sicily, and you have um, uh, Sicily that is formerly part of the crown of Aragon, but you have Aragonese troops that go fighting for the Angevins, so practically from the opposite side of, of Sicily, for the Florentines, um, against the Ghibellines, by the way, so in theory also against the Empire that in general was, um, you know, the, the, the one, again, sponsoring also the same, the same Sicily, uh, but in general, also the also in the rivalry between France and Aragon, kind of also the same Aragon in, in some way. So uh, evidently not at that specific point. Just to tell you how actually messed up and much more complicated the situation was. The other Sicilian faction was kind of the uh, the native one. In fact, was known of the Latins and was composed of those Sicilian barons of ancient lineage that were present on the island, of course, already before the Aragonese era, and that in many cases were unavoidably linked to the Angevin rulers. Uh, among these were the Chiaramonte, the Lanza, the Palizzi, the Perollo, the Uberti. Um, some of these people are to be found um, also among, actually, the Ghibellines of northern Italy, because some of them had uh, fled at the time. Of, uh, of the Angevin conquest before and had found themselves scattered there. Um, also the, uh, the, the Ventimiglia, etc. And it originally, in bef before the Peace of Caltabellotta, these two factions were kind of at the hottest of the struggle between each other within the island because they supported these various, uh, still this un un uh, uncooled cake, let's say. After the peace, the, the 
conflict was reduced, but it was still present, if anything, also because there was this kind of foreign versus autochthonous uh, rivalry. Um, Louis of Sicily was succeeded to the throne by Frederick de Fort, nicknamed the Simple. Frederick left the kingdom to his minor daughter Mary, born from the marriage with Constance of King Peter uh, the Fort of Aragon, and it was uh, she was flanked by four vikers. There were Artale Alagona, Count of Mistretta, William Peralta, Count of Caltabellotta, Francis Ventimiglia, Count of Geraci, and Manfred Chiaramonte, the Count of Mo Mo Modica. Excuse me. Um, Artale Alagona chose the residence of the uh, Ursino Castle in Catania for the young Queen Mary, planning to give her in marriage to Gian Galeazzo Visconti, Duke of Milan. Um, this was a normal alliance, like the, the Milanese, as you know, uh, were imperial bikers in, um, uh, in Lombardy, and so they championed the Ghibelline cause, they were the largest power in, um, in communal Italy, and so that aligned that marriage would have been quite an interesting one also because of the dynastic consequences, like everything like in the Renaissance, the wars of Italy would have been different. But in fact, the faction headed by the Ventimiglia wanted the um, young queen to be married to Martin, who was the son of the Duke of Montblanc, presumed heir to the Aragonese throne at the time. And so there was a kidnapping of the same Mary, uh, who was carried out by uh, John Raymond Moncada, Count of Agosta. Um, and um, there were some plans like that um, brought to the failure of the Count of Mistretta and that allowed the Queen's marriage to Martin of Montblanc in 1392. Mary died in 1402, and so at this point the Aragonese Sicilian branch, let's call it this way, that until had reigned in Sicily, became ex extinct. Uh, so um, King Martin I at that point married uh, Blanche, uh, heir to the throne of Navarre, who chose to settle in Catania together with her court. Then Martin I died in Cagliari, in, uh, Sa in Sardinia, in 1409, at the age of 33, and he was succeeded by his old father, Martin the Elder, King of Aragon, who, however, died the following year, too. Um, Sardinia, in this scenario, is, is important because in 1325, the Aragonese had um, crushed the Pisan army and their German mercenaries, um, at uh, Buco Cisterna in, in Cagliari and seized control of the island. The, the papacy had even given them, uh, like, the papacy wasn't happy with this, but uh, on the long run it even, you know, recognized the, uh, the sovereignty on, on Corsica, which actually was never a thing. The Genoese always controlled it. And actually it was um, you know, a, a constant Genoese infiltration in Sardinia from the north um, to harass constantly, together with Sardinian guerrilla, basically the the Aragonese government that was mostly like something a coast, like a coastal presence, as always. Um, the interland Sardinia being, you know, a, a, a nightmare to say the least. Um, and the uh, so this tells you how. Also, the, the crown of Aragon dominions were composed overall, right? So it was mostly this propelling force of Catalonia managing to maintain it. Probably a talosocracy at some point, but the Aragonese navy was really sizable and it had even managed, in fact, to oust the, the Genoese from, from great parts of the Mediterranean. So it's the reason why the Genoese opened the Atlantic route in the meanwhile, which also contributed to the age of exploration, etc. Also because the Aragonese were allied with, with Venice that was didn't like the Angevins uh, controlling the Strait of Otranto, given that they were also expanding in the Pyrrhus. So uh, that was the, the game, more or less. Um, in Sicily, with the annexation of Spain to the crown of Aragon, as we've seen in the modern age, became a vice royalty 
uh, officially and lost independence, it had conquered with the revolt of the Vespers by a certain degree. Also, you know, nothing clamorously drastic occurred in the modern age compared to the Middle Ages, especially in the early modern age. Um, but surely the um, the Spanish power at that point had a much larger uh, force to impress altogether on even in places like Sicily and, and Naples. Uh, and it was being very interested in Italy, as you know, in the struggle against the French. Now, um, we were at the point where M King Martin died without heirs in 1410. right? So at this point, the Cortes of the Crown of Aragon in 1412, with the Compromise of Caspe, decided that the Castilian prince Fr uh, Ferdinand Trastamara, called um, El de Antequera, second son of King John I of Castilla and his first wife Eleanor, uh, Eleanor of Aragon, daughter of King Peter IV of Aragon and his third wife Eleanor of Sicily. Right? So there was uh, a Sicilian connection there for the succession to, to, the, to the crown of the island. So the, the territories of the crown of Aragon passed under the dominion of the collateral branch of the Trastamara, to ruling in Castile, uh, in Castilla, and immediately after his cor uh, coronation, King Ferdinand I of Aragon proclaimed the perpetual union of Sicily to the crown of Aragon. Right at this point, the Aragonese were tightening the uh, the autonomies already by creating something more statelike, and the younger son, John. Uh, was appointed from 1415 governor and viceroy of, um, of of Sicily. In 1416, Ferdinand's eldest son, Alfonso, succeeded his father. Right, and on May the 25th, 1416, he gathered all the barons and prelates of the island in the hall of the parliaments of the Ursino Castle for the oath of loyalty to the sovereign. And until August the 30th, the last acts of political life took place that saw essentially Catania as the capital of the Kingdom of Sicily. King Alfonso himself allowed the birth of the University of Catania, um, that became the General Studium of Sicily, the oldest in the island, in fact, in 1434. This tells you how relatively peripheral um, the same Sicily had remained compared to other um, the countries, given that, uh, as you know, Frederick II had already began to favor, in part, the uh, the this the southern uh, Italian part more. Uh, the same Naples had seen the foundation of the Studium, became the most important. Um, still, of the broader, eventually, of the reunified Kingdom of Sicily under the Aragonese. Um, but still witnesses the, the growth of the cities as well. In, 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 in 1442, Alfonso conquered the Kingdom of Naples. As you know, there were two expeditions. In the first one, he had been captured by the, uh, the Genoese who brought him to the Milanese. And during captivity, he convinced the, the, the Duke of Milan that actually an Aragonese presence in the south to, to take out the Angevins would have been more preferable. So in the second expedition, uh, supported by by Milan, um, uh, Aragon managed to to seize control of the kingdom. Alfonso assumed the title of Rex Utriusque Sicilia, which means properly king of both Sicilies, uh, given the split that had institutionally occurred. And this is in fact the name that said it too. Actually, the two realms remain separated. Right, so that what is called also the Kingdom of Two Sicilies later on, it's, it comes actually later in the modern age, but still echoing this. Uh, in fact, the what had remained up to that time, right, two, two separated entities, administratively speaking, despite being under the Spanish. And and so, in fact, it's under Alfonso V that formally the two kingdoms were kind of um, unified in a. In a practical sense, or less two kings, because it would suffice just one to be uh, to be considered. But still, there, there was um, the feeling that these were two different countries, and in fact, they were 
just even traditional culture. Excuse me, I drink a little. So the um, last two kings are the same as those of the kingdom of Aragon. That is, John II and Ferdinand II, the latter famously marrying uh, Isabel of Castile in 1469. In 1492, King Ferdinand, with the enactment of the decree of the Alhambra, expelled the Jews from all the realms in his possession, and most of the Sicilian Jews emigrated to the Maghreb and the Ottoman Empire. Others went to Calabria, which already had a community um, of Jews since the 4th century. Right? Uh, but they would, the Jews would be expelled also from, from the Kingdom of Naples with... Um, the, the decree that started being valid there uh, since 1524 as well. Um, the Trastamara dynasty died out in a direct male sense with the same Ferdinand, the Catholic, as he promoted the only son of his first wife, Queen Isabel, the crown prince John, without heirs. On the death of, of Isabel in, in 1504, he was uh, succeeded by um, his uh, daughter, Joanna, Joanna Loca, so-called, who had married, like the marriage of the, of the millennium, in a sense, uh, Philip of Habsburg, right? Um, so the, the son of the Duke of Austria and Holy Roman Emperor. But the uh, regency remained with his father, Ferdinand, until his death in 1516. <laughs> And, and so, as you know, the crowns of Aragon and Castile in the same year passed to the Habsburgs um, that um, were under the, uh, you know, the control of Charles, son of uh, Philip and, um, and Johan. And this represented the beginning of the era of properly Spanish rather than just Aragonese Sicily. Um, but that's another story in the modern age, and so far we don't cover uh, modern history, um, historical regions, but we could start telling the truth, because at some point, well, it, it, it's a long road before we fin <laughs> finish with the medieval ones, because there were really a lot, uh, and as you know, my channel mostly focuses on medieval history, but it's an idea for the future, we're going to have time at some point, and that's it, like, um, some, let's say, uh, the, the history of Naples is much more interesting objectively because it just was bigger, right, and more developed and kind of going on as properly the center of eventually what would also the, the Sicily, Sicily would be ruled from historically. But it's still important, in fact, to understand how this, um, this switch occurred, given that Sicily was the kingdom itself in uh, in the in the span of basically less than a century, it it the trend was re reversed right from from the time of the of the Normans uh, and of of the Hohenstaufen right the, the just the prestige of the island completely fell right and this is also important retrospectively uh, because personally like I don't hear much. I don't see videos here. The criteria for which my videos are watched sometimes very strange, even though I have all the analytics here. But I realize that you tend to watch more, or at least in general, maybe because there are less videos on on this uh, on on these topics. These kind of basic history videos than than others, right? And I see when I when I talked about I don't know these, for example, the Sicilian series, that there is actually a lot of interest. I don't I don't know exactly why because I personally think sometimes to make a, a video and say oh my god you know they're gonna like it so much and that nobody cares so I don't understand exactly what you're looking for but then I realized that in part it's maybe because of the algorithm that you know uh, you know it's crazy yes of course but then maybe because there are literally not enough videos on these basic things that I think a general audience naturally maybe likes the most but it's also important to to stress that there is uh, a broader culture in, in uh, because of the latter aspect, a broader cultural 
forgetfulness about these other medieval entities. Um, I don't even know exactly what it's out there. At the beginning I thought that, I don't know, probably there is a lot of English and French medieval history on YouTube, right? And maybe the rest of Europe is not really talked about a lot. Well, I, instead I see it's probably sometimes nothing, right? <laughs> so I'm realizing that. Uh, as a as a base to build up the channel, maybe these videos are useful and uh, it's important for me to deliver like uh, kind of an objective view uh, about even the probably the comparative um, dimension, right? Uh, because I think what you want to hear is not just the story; it's just kind of the broader assessment. And 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 I realize it's difficult to to find this because. If if uh, most videos are made by you know in prepared fashion by people who don't were not really the ones that make the research eventually, and or uh, they 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 properly uh, or either they fix just in, with one country you know they can't give a dimension a depth a perspective on the wall right I think history is cool because contrary to the paranoid mentality that is spreading everywhere what you actually must be able to do historically is to provide with a judgment of what you observe not because otherwise what's the use of history in the first place right it, 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 you cannot even separate the two things neurocognitively speaking it, it's obvious and this this idea is kind of not provided instead most videos are like oh look maybe there's this kingdom is so cool uh, but then you know just list the basic facts you can find easily elsewhere but not really you know, adding that, oh, okay, I've seen this before, I know what we're talking about, I know I can't connect the broader thing, it becomes like an intensively kind of decontextualized, hyper kind of ob obsessive uh, obsessification of, of the concept that like kind of an hypostatic, hypostatic ideal of, of, of what the country is and not really contextualizing it, it in reality, right? In fact, uh, when I get when I make these videos, I remember uh, this more ethnic, these various countries. Like I don't know, I think I made something about the principality of Moldova recently. It was somebody from Moldova, I presume, that was talking in, in first person plural that was saying, you know, whenever you know foreigners make videos, but it's it's either there are our nationalistic videos about this, or other foreigners that talk about us. I don't know, with you know, with not for pity, or he said something like with. Uh, you know, trying to exalt, but you know, the narrative just to to make the thing nicer. Instead, you say the objective thing. Well, that's the best thing I can hear because I I, I know that I can't be fully objective, but at least it's my like it's my purpose, <laughs> right? It's my um, it's what I, I make history for, right? I, I want to be as real as possible because otherwise, what what do you do history for? Um, in any case, as I was saying at the beginning, this is the last, uh, not video about Sicily, medieval Sicily, of course, we'll probably often talk about this often. Um, again, it's just, you know, this series that I started from last year, that I think it's very nice, because, as I just said, it covers all of Europe, um, especially also areas that you don't hear much about, in un unjustifiably, I think, and that's where the judgment comes easy. And for today, however, I stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.